we covered uh, thymus and bone marrow in our previous class and we also have covered this particular diagram in which which is showing the sizes first increasing and then decreasing for the thymus and at the age of 60 or beyond 60 years the organ is having uh, 3 to 5 grams only but in the in this age around 10 to 12 years it is reported to have around 70 uh, grams of weight Right, so it is written here the 70 gram in the infants, but it is about three to five grams in uh, elderly. Right. Today, we will start with the lymphatic system. So, in the previous classes, also we have discussed several times that in our body there are two systems, two circulatory systems. One is blood, and the second one is lymph. So in the, this class, we are going to cover three things. First is uh, these lymphatic system. What is lymph, how it is circulating. Actually for the blood, we are having a pump. We are having heart. But for lymph, actually we do not have any pump to circulate, uh, to help circulating this uh, fluid in our body. So the question is how the lymph is circulated throughout our body. So first of all, we will uh, have one diagram which will which will which will help us to understand how this system is. Okay, so we are having blood circulatory system all over our body. Similarly, we are having so these uh, lymph arteries are shown in this diagram. So they are also uh, present all over our body. So the lymphatic vessels and these are lymph nodes. These dot-like structures which are shown in this particular diagram are lymph nodes. So lymph nodes can be considered as secondary lymphoid organs. Uh, one more thing I wish to uh, say here. So actually the primary lymphoid organs are called central lymphoid organs. Whereas the secondary lymphoid organs, you can call them peripheral lymphoid organs. All right. So you need to... Uh, know this the central uh, lymphoid organs are primary and the the second one the secondary lymphoid organs are or can be considered as peripheral lymphoid organs which is also written in pathfinder all right so so this circulatory system called lymphatic uh, system it is having uh, major ducts which are present around heart which is present near heart so one is called light sorry right lymphatic duct and left subclavian vein all right and in between uh, so this is left subclavian vein and uh, this one is actually thoracic duct so the lymph which is circulating all over body will come in right lymphatic duct and then it will drain it into the thoracic duct through the thoracic duct it will be uh, it will be emptied into the left subclavian vein so that's how it will uh, it will be managed and how this unidirectional flow is maintained so we will understand this with the help of one more diagram so if you see this particular diagram so it is showing the lymphatic capillaries right which are having connection with the uh, one side they are interacting with the tissue spaces the second side they are they are continuing with the lymphatic vessels which are more broad in terms of diameter right then you are able to see these structures i'm trying to annotate this so that you can understand what i'm going to uh, all right so are you able to observe these structures? These are kind of wall, wall-like structures, which do not allow the lymph to flow back. So once the lymph is coming in this direction, it will continue to move in this direction. It will not allow the lymph to move in some other direction, all right? So it will uh, maintain the unidirectional flow of the lymph. All right, in this direction, for example. So, now understand how exactly this is maintained. So it is uh, with the help of these unidirectional valves 
the lymph will flow only in this direction. It will not flow reverse. Now from there, this lymph is coming. So actually lymph is the part of blood itself. So uh, in the tissue spaces, some of our blood or the some component of our blood is lost and it will come into the second uh, circulatory system called lymph. And finally, this lymph will be added back to the blood so that maintaining a steady state. All right. But uh, uh, when this lymph is flowing through the system, it is a proper channel. So it is made up of lymphatic capillaries. There are lymphatic vessels. Lymphatic vessels are connected to the lymph nodes, which are the, the structures, which are the organs. Uh, having large populations of B and T cells. All right. So these lymph nodes are actually secondary or peripheral lymphoid organs, which are present in all our body and they are responsible for presenting the exogenous antigens uh, to the cells. So exactly where the B and T cell will face the antigens, real antigens, so in the secondary lymphoid organs. So the well-organized structures are lymph node and spleen. So we also have some non- uh, not well organized structures which are collectively known as malt we will discuss this in detail right so malt is actually made up of uh, appendix you can put appendix uh, and other organs for example uh, what i should say tonsils and uh, ears patches all are part of malt so malt is a collective term in which you can put all the organs which are not well maintained well organized but since we can see the structure of lymph node and spleen, we will discuss both. They are well organized structures where antigen will be presented to the B and T cells, to the T cells, and then the B cells will be activated and they will be differentiated into the effector and memory cells. Effector cells are known as plasma cells. They will secrete large number of antibody molecules, and finally, they will try to neutralize or uh, remove the antigen or pathogen. All right. So, so first understand this diagram and then I'm um, coming back to the discussion. Beyond this uh, lymphatic system and how everything is maintained, we are going to discuss secondary lymphoid organs in this class. Uh, majorly, we have structure of uh, spleen and lymph nodes. So we will discuss both of them. Also, we will cover some of the mal tissue, which is not very much organized, but uh, we will try to discuss it. Then, okay, so the other thing is very much importance of uh, here. So we are going to cover the antigen presentation, right? So because the real antigens will be presented in the secondary lymphoid organ. So we will try to cover uh, antigen presenting cells and how the antigens are presented. There are two pathways, one for exogenous antigens, one for endogenous antigens or the antigens which are actually present within the cells, for example, some viral proteins. Or... All right, so let's start discussing. So it is made up of uh, lymphatic capillaries. These are connected to the lymphatic vessels. The lymphatic vessels will carry the lymph to the lymphoid. Uh... So these are afferent lymphatic vessels, afferent. And then finally, there is a lymph node. Lymph node is having a large number of uh, primary and secondary follicles. Now, uh, you need to understand what is the difference between a primary and secondary follicle. Do you know what is the difference or should I explain this to you? Iba. Do you know what is the difference between a primary and secondary follicle? Primary follicle comprises of a network of follicular lymphatic cells. Okay. Like, um, and the secondary uh, follicle? And, uh, uh, secondary follicles after antigeny challenge, this uh, primary follicle becomes uh, larger and this becomes secondary follicles. Exactly. So actually uh, after antigen presentation or antigenic challenge, uh, there is a central cavity which is actually known as germinal center. So this is the major difference between a primary follicle and secondary follicle. Secondary follicle do have a germinal center, primary follicle do not have any germinal centers. Uh, rest of the thing you understand. All right. So um, 
Very good, means you are studying. So now the question is, okay, so I will come to this. Okay, I will come back again. I will tell you uh, how the antigen is presented actually. And uh, obviously we have discussed the antigen presenting cells or B cell macrophages and uh, dendritic cells. Uh, I also told uh, that the dendritic cells are all best antigen presenting cells. Okay. But I do not know whether you know this or not, uh, why the dendritic cells are considered as best APCs. Do you know this? I will be happy if you know this. I don't know, sir. Yeah, no. Okay, actually, this is uh, given in the second chapter itself, uh, means you did not uh, read the second chapter completely. All right. So, finally, the lymph, which is actually coming from here, from the tissue spaces, through the lymphatic capillaries, through the lymphatic vessels, which is actually afferent lymphatic vessel. Why it is called afferent? Because it is leading lymph towards the lymph node. So afferent means towards. And then it is followed by big lymphatic vessels, even larger than these, which are known as efferent. It means it is taking away the lymph, uh, away from this particular lymph node. So that's how they are connected. So, Lymphatic system, everything else is written in the theory. Uh, as blood circulate under pressure, obviously we are having a pump. Its flood component that is called plasma seeps through the thin wall of the capillaries into the surrounding tissues, which are having tissue spaces, right? And uh, when the plasma is coming out of blood capillaries into the tissue spaces, it will move through these lymphatic capillaries into the another circulating system which is actually known as lymph. So you can uh, interchange these two terms. Actually the plasma is the actual lymph in which you are having large number of lymphocytes. All right, so much of this fluid is actually uh, coming from this uh, portion of the blood is actually making the lymph. Then this uh, much of this fluid uh, called interstitial fluid written to the blood through the capillary membranes. So when it will move back through the left subclavian vein, uh, it will be added back to the blood and therefore it will maintain a, a fixed volume of blood. Okay, otherwise what will happen? Uh, the volume of blood will decrease with time if uh, it will lose plasma in form of limb continuously. So it needs to maintain a steady state, therefore it will be added back uh, through the capillary membranes. Uh, the remainder of the interstitial fluid, which is actually known as lymph, it will flow in the, this system, which is lymphatic system. Flows from the spaces in the connective tissues into the network of the tinny, open lymphatic capillaries and then into a series of progressively larger collecting vessels. These are called lymphatic vessels. All right. So the largest lymphatic vessel, this question has already been asked. So actually I'm giving this an emphasis. So this largest lymphatic vessel is the thoracic duct, which will empty into, which will empties into the left subclavian vein near the heart. As I showed you in the diagram, uh, this is considered as the biggest uh, Thing. So thoracic duct is situated just above your heart. So right. So this thoracic duct is considered as <clears throat> all right. So this is the largest lymphatic vessel, uh, and then it will uh, empty into the left subclavian vein, which is just <clears throat> below it. In this way, lymphatic system captures the fluid lost from the blood and return it back to the blood, thus ensuring a steady state level of blood, 
within the circulatory system or within the uh, blood. So the heart does not pump the lymph through the lymphatic system. So this is a major drawback. It is not having any kind of pump to, uh, to help circulating the lymph, right? Uh, instead, the flow of lymph is achieved as the lymph vessels are sequenced by the movement of body muscles. So the question is how the lymph is circulated throughout our body. So it is simple. When we do movements, actually our muscles will help moving the lymph from one portion of our body to other portions. That's how it will be uh, circulated throughout our body. All right. So with the help of body's muscles, uh, the movement is done. So a series of one-way valves now because they are having these valve-like structures which and which help the lymph to flow in single direction. That's how the when we move over one part of our body, it will squeeze the lymph into the another. Right. That's how it will the flow is maintained. Just very simple system of uh, circulation. So a series of one-way walls, we occur this. When a foreign antigen gain entrance to the tissues, it is picked up by lymphatic system. That uh, is known because uh, it is having lymph node-like structures, which are secondary lymphoid organs. So obviously, if an antigen is coming from outside, it will be entrapped into the secondary lymphoid organs and will be presented to the T helper cells. The T helper cell will secrete large number of cytokines and then will be active, will activate the B cells, which will be differentiated into the plasma cells and humoral response will be activated. Not only humoral, the cell mediated immune, immune response if it is intracellular antigen. So most of the intracellular antigens or the cells which are abnormal are killed by the second branch called cell mediated immune response, which is either so the abnormal cells can be killed by the natural killer cells. We have studied an innate immune response, but in adaptive immune response, the T cytotoxic cells are major cells, which are also known as uh, CD8 positive cells, right? So they will uh, interact with antigens over MSC class one molecules. So one question actually I have shared in the group, uh, which has been asked in the June 2019 paper of CSIR. Okay, so very easy question. If you know which kind of receptor will interact with each other, so the CD4 will interact with MSC class second, CD8 will interact with the MSC class one molecules. Similarly, the T cell receptor will recognize the MSC either class one or class two directly, right? And one more molecule called CD28, right? So this actually we did not discuss yet, but antigen presentation is done with the help of CD28 because the CD28 will interact with the, so let me move to page number 37. All right, so there are some molecules which are given, which will be uh, presented over T cells, okay. lymphocytes actually. So B7 molecules are two types, B71, which are known as CD80. And the second is B7 second, which is actually known as CD86. These are molecules which interact with the CD28. So either CD80 or CD86, but most often they are called as B71 or B72. So you need to uh, remember both B7 because it is asked in terms of B7, but somewhere you can face that it can be asked in terms of CD. So cluster of differentiations, 80 and 86 respectively, they can interact with CD28. Okay, and this antigen, CTLA4, Importantly, uh, they regulate uh, they regulate molecules on the surface of different types of T cells, which are including T helper cells. So, T helper cell will interact with the antigen presenting cells, and then they 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 are showing this kind of interactions. The B cell molecules will interact with CD20. All right. So, if you understand this, you can easily answer a four mark question, which actually 
already has been asked. All right. So now the question is, first, we have covered this, the lymph uh, system or lymphatic, uh, how the lymph is flowing in the lymphatic system. Now the secondary lymphoid organs. So because it is having this structures called lymph node, not only this, other uh, can, others can be considered as secondary lymphoid organs. For example, spleen and malt I have disclosed, okay. So, uh, we need not go into the details of primary follicle, secondary follicle. So obviously the secondary follicles are large and after an antigenic challenge, the primary follicle becomes a larger secondary follicle, which is a ring of concentric packed B lymphocytes and they are having a central uh, zone, which is germinal center. If you do not understand, uh, this diagram is also depicting this. Germinal center is a region where the population of cells is low but they are having active cells because uh, the, and they are interacting with antigens, actively interacting with antigens. Follow, so, the surrounded by a mantle M, which is densely packed, and then there are large number of uh, lymphocytes which are present in the secondary follicle. All right, though very small number is shown in this particular diagram, but exactly how they are seen under the microscope, they are there. This is a view. Now, similarly, as we have discussed for the T helpers, uh, sorry, T cells. So in the last class, we covered this diagram, this flow chart, how the T cells are developed, either into CD4 positive or CD8 positive cells. Uh, okay, so from the hematopoietic stem cell, they are becoming a double negative cell, which are having four stages, double negative cell one, two, three, four, finally become double positive cells and uh, because double positive cells should be converted into a single positive cell, either CD8 positive or CD4 positive cells, then only they can move into the peripheral tissues or in the secondary lymphoid organs. All right, so this development of T cells is actually happening in the thymus, first in the thymic cortex, then in the medullary region. Through the blood, then they will move into the secondary lymphoid organs or peripheral lymphoid organs. Okay, similarly, as I told you that more than 95% of the cells will be killed through the selection process. They are eliminated because either they will interact too strongly or they will not interact at all. Only the cells which are showing intermediate uh, affinities, they will survive. So with the help of this one, we have discussed this, that there is death by neglect, means they are not having the affinity, binding affinity is too low. They are fail, they are failed to be positively selected. Therefore, they, are, they, will, they will be uh, they undergoing the apoptosis. This is called death by neglect. Most of the cells, T e cells, which will die by this process, number is 90% up to 96%. The second is intermediate affinity, uh, which are positively selected and therefore they will able to, they are able to survive. Only two to five percent of the, all the T cells are able to survive. Affinity too high means they are recognizing the self MSE molecule with self antigens too high affinity, so they should be removed. Otherwise, they will create some problem or lead to autoimmune diseases. So they will be deleted. So this is called deletion, or they will die by apoptosis. So two to five percent of the cells will die by this process. So actually, this is a strict procedure in which only two to five percent of the cells will survive otherwise all will be killed similarly in the second one the b cell selection so b cell is also uh, undergoing several stages of development we covered in the last class but if you do not remember uh, we'll move to this diagram 251 so this cell which is becoming a mature b sorry mature b cell is coming through various stages Pro B cell, pre B cell, immature, naive B cell, and then finally into a mature B cell, which is having both antibodies, IgM and IgG, or this is receptors. Right. So <clears throat> during selection, during activation, uh, there is this is also a very strict process of selecting the B cells, and more than 90% of B cells are killed 
in the selection process, similar to the T cells, right? So this is already written in your book. Most antigen activated B cells, which will divide and differentiate into antibody pro producing plasma cells in the lymphoid follicles, but only a few B cells in the, in this, in the antigen activation population, antigen activated population find their way into the germinal center. Only a few will survive in this germinal center. Now the question is how many? So those that do not undergo one or more rounds of cell division during which the genes are encoded, uh, that encode their antibodies mutate at an unusually high rate. So actually this is a process where when the B cell will divide, they will show a high mutation rate. Why this? Because they need to express large number of uh, different uh, receptor molecules, antibody molecules over their cell surface so that they can recognize large number of antigens. So this process, uh, when they divide, they are undergoing one or more rounds of cell division. During this time, they are actually showing unusual high rate of mutations so that they can produce large number of antibody diversity. Following this period of division and mutation, this mutation is very important during this division period. Uh, there are rigorous selection process in which more than 90% of these B cell will die by apoptosis. Now you need to understand this because this question has already been asked that the B cell is having <coughs> antibody diversity so that they can, recognize, they can recognize a large number of antigen molecules or epitopes actually before any antigen is encountered by the body. You understand this or I sh should I uh, repeat this statement? Understood. Understood. Okay, so the antibody molecules, because they are present, they are showing a huge diversity over the B cell surface, they are present before any antigenic challenge to the body. And uh, this is, uh, advantage, this is a kind of advantage to uh, the animal because we already have large number of receptor molecules which can recognize a large number of antigen molecules, but somehow the antigen or the pathogen sometimes is uh, so smart that they can uh, survive, they can escape from the, this large or the huge number of antibody diversity or the antibody molecules. Right. So, but because this high number is produced due to the mutations, but the reason is during this rigorous selection process, more than 90% of B cells will die by apoptosis. Otherwise they can even interact or recognize a very large population of antigens or epitopes. In general, those B cell producing antibodies that bind to the antigen more strongly have a much better chance of surviving than to their weaker uh, companions, actually, which can interact with the antigens or which can those B cells which are producing antibodies uh, and binding to the antigen more strongly, they're having more chances of surviving, unlike T cells, which are interacting with the MSC molecules, self MSC molecules with the self antigens, right? So the small number of B cells that survive the germinal center, like uh, this rigorous process of selection, differentiate into a plasma cell and a memory cell. This already I told you, if you do not remember, the cell cycle is given over page number 30 and 33. You can go and find this. So whenever a B cell is activated with the help of the helper cell, so uh, not only this interaction of uh, MSC class molecules, because B cells are antigen presenting cells. So when they present the antigen to the T helper cell, uh, the T cell receptor interacting with the MSC class second molecule and the T helper cell are secreting large number of cytokines in, including interleukin-4. So it will activate the B cell. Second thing is this antigen is also uh, helping. The, it can also not only present the antigen with the help of MSC class second molecule so that it will activate the T helper cells because it is an antigen presenting cell. It is also having second role because it is having membrane receptor molecules which can recognize large number of antigen molecules or their epitopes. They will directly interact with the antigen molecule and it will give some kind of signal so that it will activate the B cell. Once the B cell is activated, it is showing cytokine receptors expression high over, the, over its surface and BCL2 level will decrease, right? So finally what will happen, the B cell will be activated. 
and it will be activated either it will lead to the plasma cell uh, okay or a memory b cell so the two cell will form one is effect one is effector cell which is called plasma cell uh, which is having different means large num content of uh, golgi bodies and endoplasmic reticulum so that it can synthesize large number of uh, antibody molecules or proteins and it can secrete it second difference is it do not have the membrane receptors or these antibody uh, receptors so and these memory b cells will be required at subsequent exposure or the second thing is it will die by apoptosis right if it is not uh, going to differentiate or an inappropriate activating signal it will going to die and uh, if it is everything is fine so it will divide into the effector and memory cells second is 33 so we have also covered this uh, cell cycle diagram ultimately what will happen when b cell will move into the cell cycle uh, it will first make lymphoblast which is a cell in the s phase which is large in size finally it will uh, doing cell division and this cell is going to make two cells one is effector cell or it will be going to make a memory cell so that's how the cell cycle of b cell is happening but you also keep this into your mind that whenever there is a cell cycle or the b cell is going to divide there is an increased mutation rate so that a large diversity of antibody molecules can be generated now the lymph node and spleen are the most highly organized secondary lymphoid organs as we have discussed earlier also so lymph node and the second is we are going to cover the spleen otherwise we are also having malt which is actually called mucosa associated lymphoid tissue which is a loose drum for ears patches so present in the small intestine tonsils and appendix these uh, organs are coming under the same <coughs> umbrella term which is called malt mucosa associated lymphoid tissue so actually all these lymph nodes spleen and malt which is including ps patches appendix and tonsils they are secondary lymphoid organs or peripheral lymphoid organs where the antigens will be presented right so it was as, as well as the numerous uh, lymphoid follicles within the lamina propria of the intestine and upper airways in the bronchus uh, region or the genital tract in all these sites you will find some secondary lymphoid organs now first is lymph node lymph node is the site uh, where immune response are mounted to the antigens which are present in the lymph so because lymph is circulating through the lymph nodes and thus the antigens which are coming from outside or exogenous antigens can be entrapped very easily they are encapsulated bean shaped structures this is very interesting so the structure we are going to discuss in detail uh, this is a lymph node if you look into the structure this is a bean shaped like structure which is having capsule uh, region right so coated with capsule there are three regions cortex paracortex and medulla so right so cortex region now i will tell you the what is the difference between all the regions there is different micro environment in all the three regions so first of all is cortex cortex is a b cell rich area you, you may be asked this question this is quite a uh, tricky you for the structural point of view and to understand the functioning of a lymph node you should remember that the cortex is a b cell rich area so you will find more number of b cell in this area so cortex is b cell rich then there is a paracortex which is t cell rich area all right so wait a minute i'm trying to find something for you so in the cortex you will find b cells are more also there are some antigen presenting cells including macrophages and follicular dendritic cells but uh, majorly you are uh, for uh, lymphocyte point of view you will find more b cell in this area then the t cells uh, which are more in the paracortex region now the question is medulla is having what kind of cells so actually there is a combination of b and t cells you will find both types of both types of cells in the medullary region 
and uh, actually the activated b cells uh, so cortex is having nave b cells when these b cells are activated they are moving to the medullary region so medulla is actually having activated uh, b cells which are uh, differentiated into a plasma cell and continue to secrete the antibody molecule so you can call them the plasma cells or the differentiated b cells are present in the medullary region along with some t cells right so both b and t cells are found in the medullary region and the activated b cells which are called plasma cells which will secrete large number of antibody molecules got it so paracortex region is thymus dependent area and uh, cortex region is thymus independent area exactly uh, we are going to discuss that on that that part only so it is also written here in the text so lymph node is uh, pericortex is therefore sometimes referred to as a thymus dependent area because uh, it is having t cells and contrast to the cortex which is thymus independent area so you can also uh, write in the diagram itself so here we have written the b cells here we have written the t cells so actually the cortex is ti thymus independent right so sorry i cannot all right so you need to understand pericortex is thymus dependent so this is td uh, because having t cells and this is thymus independent so you use ti because it is having large number of b cells all right now if you understand the structure uh, now try to understand how it is going to function right so the lymph node is a site where immune responses are happening and it uh, this i already told you whatever is written in the first paragraph so as lymph percolate through the node uh, any particulate antigen that is brought with the lymph area will be entrapped into the cellular network of the phagocytic cells and dendritic cells which are actually present in the Uh, lymph nodes follicular cells are present in the cortex interdigitating cells are present in the para paracortex region right why so because interdigitating cells are showing more number of msc class second molecules so they are efficient uh, antigen presenting cells therefore they are present in the thymus dependent area because they need to uh, activate the t cells t helper cells right by interacting directly with them got it so the overall architecture of a lymph node support an ideal micro environment for the lymphocyte effectively encounter and respond to the trapped antigens all right so first uh, before uh, moving or should i complete this okay let's finish this then we will uh, see how the antigens are presented okay so this i told you okay so it is written here in this line actually lymph node taken from neonate uh, thymectomized mice have usually few cells in the paracortical region what it mean thymectomized mice means if you remove the thymus somehow or you will kill the uh, all the cells present in the thymus by radiation or some other treatment all right so in the previous discussion in the previous class we covered this uh, it will lead to a disease called as nude mice in the mice and in humans the same if you remove the thymus of a human now the disease is known as dijojo syndrome very good so dijojo syndrome all right okay we also have discussed one more disease in case of natural killer cells that that was very important what was the name of that particular disease if we do not have enough uh, natural killer cells then a disease will result which is an autosomal recessive disease what was the name of that particular disease eva you forgot higash chediak higashi syndrome
If you don't remember, I should. I can show you. It's associated with impairment in neutrophils, macrophages, and menstrual killer cells. Hmm. So it is an autosomal recessive disorder, which is the lake of uh, natural killer cells. See, this, these, these uh, syndromes and diseases are very, very important because you can uh, see these simple questions in any uh, university exam. Even some university examinations, they can even ask these type of questions because you should know. Okay. This we have covered the thymus dependent and independent area. In the most part, it's called medulla. It is more specially populated with the lymphoid linear cells. All right, so mo mostly the plasma cells actually secreting the antibody molecules are present there because they are differentiated or activated in the cell, whatever you call it. So generally it takes four to six days of the antigenic challenge. So once an antigen is coming into your body, it will take four to six days uh, to reach so that uh, it can uh, it can activate the secondary lymphoid organs so that uh, few B cells and T helper cells migrate to the primary follicles of the cortex. It is not known why this migration is, uh, what causes this migration to the primary lymphoid organs. All right, but uh, it is seen that about four to six or seven days, uh, these B cells, only few B cells and T helper cells will migrate to the primary follicles of the cortex. Maybe they are going to activate some other uh, lymphocytes uh, present there. Okay, it is not known, but okay, so within the primary follicle, the cellular interactions between follicular and dendritic cells, B cells, T helper cells will be taking place and leading to the development of the secondary follicles with the central germinal center and which are large in size. Some of the plasma cells generating in the germinal center move to the medullary areas of the lymph node and many migrate to the bone marrow, which are primary lymphoid organs, as he <coughs> given a kill you in the first line also. Now, Okay, so coming to this particular major diagram, right? So here you can see uh, the secondary lymphoid organs which are having germinal centers and there are primary lymphoid follicles which are densely packed. You are not able to see any germinal center and they are having uh, non-activated cells because there is no antigen exposure or antigenic challenge. Finally, these primary lymphoid follicles will uh, be converted into the secondary lymphoid follicles and once the antigen will be encountered. Similarly, uh, the lymph nodes as given in the previous diagram, they are having afferent lymphatic vessels and afferent, efferent, E4, away, efferent lymphatic vessels. You are able to see the arrows here, so it is showing the direction of lymph uh, flow. So through these afferent lymphatic vessels, it is coming from uh, tissue spaces and finally, it will, uh, if it is having any particulate antigen, it will uh, be entrapped in the in this network here, and finally uh, the lymph will move. All right. So it is having two structures. One is called lymphatic arteries and lymphatic veins, shown in red and blue, respectively. And finally, they are merging here. So these are known as post-capillary venules. Now, what is this? Uh, this is the reason means this is highly branched network or the network like structure where uh, lymphatic arteries and veins are joined together. Uh, the substructure is also shown in this. So this cross section of post capillary venule is shown in this diagram, which is showing high endothelial venule HEV. If you are able to see this structure here in the center, this is called high endothelial venule, HEV. You can also write here so that you can remember this. Should I draw this? So this is high endothelial venule here. All 
All right. So the capsule is shown, which is present all over the lymph node. And this is subcapsular uh, sinus present uh, just below the capsule is a subcellular or oh, sorry subcapsular um, sinus right you can also write this this is subcellular subcapsular subcapsular i'm repeatedly saying uh, cellular actually i have read so much of cells so every time i subcapsular sinus all right, what is beyond this? So it is having a I am not able to shrink this. Okay. So the B lymphocytes are shown in the germinal center. The surrounding cells are B lymphocytes. It is capsule, primary lymphoid for second lymphoid follicles. Uh, right. So this is having very simple structural organization, uh, mainly having primary and secondary uh, lymphoid follicles and uh, large number of antigen presenting cells. And most important is this particular diagram, which is showing the cortex, paracortex, and medullary region. Uh, which is ha which is having different micro environments because uh, pericortex is thymus dependent is having large number of t cells the cortex is having large number of b cells whereas medulla is rich in both type of cells i hope uh, this diagram these two diagrams are understandable and if you do not understand anything everything is written in the theory portion so you can read if you face any query you can ask anything okay I do not think anything else which should be explained is given in this text. Okay, so one line is uh, medullary plasma cells, uh, which are differentiated B cells, uh, has a 50 fold higher concentration of lymphocyte than in the afferent lymph. Obviously, uh, when the there are two terms, afferent and efferent, right? Afferent lymph is actually coming to the lymph node, and when it is leaving the lymph node, it is known as efferent. E E will come uh, instead of A. So when we compare these two, it will have fifty-fold higher concentration of lymphocytes or activated plasma cells uh, in the efferent lymph. All right. So if you have a query, you can ask from the lymph node portion. So actually it is, uh, it is this diagram is also very, very important. You need to understand this. So uh, because the lymph uh, is in this area, in the lymph node, how these cells are coming. So it is actually this cell, which is present in the lymphatic uh, uh, capillary or in the lymphatic vessel is moving out of it and it is coming in this area in the lymph node um, in between these two cells right there is some area in between these two cells and this is coming out of this structure in the out of this uh, post capillary venule so actually this high endothelial venule why this also this is called hev because it will allow the movement of lymphocytes out of these structures through these structures, they can migrate outside uh, of these uh, lymphatic arteries and veins, and then they will come into the lymph nodes. All right, so it is written here. 
And so this process is called extravasation, okay? Coming out of the anything capillary or vein. So if it is uh, sequeezing out between the two cells, this process is called extravasation. This we already discussed in case of neutrophils also. So extravasation, chemotexas, these terms are already discussed. Estimate that are 25% that are of the lymphocyte leaving the lymph node uh, have migrated across this endothelial layer and enter into the node from the blood itself because antigenic stimulation within the node can increase this migration tenfold, right? What will happen if there is an antigenic challenge or stimulation? The number of the, or the migration uh, will uh, be about 10 times. Concentration of lymphocyte in the node that is actively responding to, uh, it will increase greatly and the node swell visibly. It is showing that the lymph nodes are swelling. And this one, this one will be a symptom called as inflammation. So whenever we are having infection, uh, our body is showing swelling and fever. Uh, okay, so this swelling is maybe because of these lymph nodes are having more number of uh, actively responding to the a antigenic challenge and therefore the nodes will swell uh, which are which can be visibly seen factors related to the uh, which are factors released with the lymph nodes during the antigenic stimulation are thought to facilitate this increased migration so it will release large number of chemical signaling molecules which will help in number increasing the number so that more number of cells will migrate all right Second is spleen. But before moving into the spleen portion, I would like to tell how the antigens are presented to the before, even before the moving into the this portion, and why there we will move to the page number 43 first so that we can understand how this is happening. So Majorly, there are four types of dendritic cells, uh, which are arising from the common hematopoietic stem cell through the process called hematopoiesis. This we have covered, right? But I did not told you that there are four different types of dendritic cells. So Langerhans cells, which are present in the skin, interstitial dendritic cells, myeloid dendritic cell, lymphoid dendritic cell. So all these three Langerhans interstitial and myeloid dendritic cells, they are actually coming out of a common myeloid progenitor cell uh, from which other uh, common neutrophils, sorry, common WBCs, including neutrophils, monocytes, uh, okay, macrophages, eosinophils, basophils, red blood cell platelets, all these are coming. And this is common lymphoid progenitor out of which the lympho lymphocytes, BT and NK cells are coming. But this common lymphoid progenitor can also give rise to the lymphoid dendritic cell, which is the fourth type of <coughs> dendritic cell. So majorly, you can divide all the, all the dendritic cells into four different types, all right? Now the question is, why we call dendritic cells the best antigen-presenting cells? So if you remember the structure of these cells, they are having these projections, right? They are having these interdigitating regions so that they can present the antigens efficiently. Not only this, if we compare them with other antigen presenting cells, so broadly we can categorize all the antigen presenting cells into two categories. One is professional antigen presenting cell, other is non-professional ones. I will tell you which cells are non-professional but uh, for the sake of clarity, we should know what are professional antigen presenting cells. So majorly three cells, B cells, <coughs> dendritic cells and macrophages, these are professional antigen presenting cells. Yani ki they have, this is their work. They need to present the antigens. They are professional in their uh, antigen presentation. So now, out of these three professional uh, antigen presenting cells, dendritic cells are the best antigen presenting cells. Why so? Because they constitutively express high levels of both class second molecules and members of co stimulatory molecules, that is, B7 family molecules. So, we have covered two molecules, B7, 
molecules B71, B, B72. B7 is actually called CD80, B72 is called CD86. They will interact with CD28 molecule, which is present over, uh, CD28 is present over T cell, whereas these B7 family members, they present over these antigen presenting cells. So CD80 or CD86, they are present over antigen presenting cells. So they are, okay, so one thing is they are having large number of, uh, constitutively expressing large number of uh, class second molecules, MSC molecules. Not only this, they are having post-stimulatory molecules and large numbers which are decent molecules. For this reason, they are more potent antigen presenting cells. And this number is more than uh, macrophages and B cells do present. So they are more potent antigen presenting cells than macrophages and B cells. Both of which need to be activated before they can function as antigen presenting cells. So these two, MSC class second molecules as well as B7 uh, post-stimulatory molecules should be activated so that they can present antigens efficiently to the the helper cells, right, with the help of MS class second molecule. Immature or precursor form of each of three sites, and I said for antigen by phagocytosis or endocytosis. Second thing is, uh, macrophages is showing phagocytosis only, but dendritic cells can perform the phagocytosis or endocytosis so that they can, and they can engulf the antigen. Antigen is processed and mature dendritic cells present this to the T helper cells. All right, so these are some reasons why dendritic cells can be considered as more potent antigen presenting cells. Now, the second discussion is uh, we need to understand first which are professional versus non professional antigen presenting cells. So, obviously, we know the professional antigen presenting cells. We are curious to know uh, non professional antigen presenting cells. Do you know some examples? Give me some examples of non-professional antigen presenting cells. Yeah, no, okay, fine. So we will move to one table, which is uh, depicting everything, right? So the table is given over page number. Where I have started this. Okay, fine, 188. So here is a table which is showing antigen presenting cells. Now there are two columns. One is professional antigen presenting cells. We have covered dendritic cells are uh, written over the top because they are best antigen presenting cells. Instead, uh, uh, macrophages and my B cells are also professional antigen presenting cells. Yes. Well, beside this, we are also having other cells, for example, fibroblasts in our skin, glial cell in the brain, which are macrophages in the brain, right? Pancreatic beta cells, same cells which will release the insulin hormone. Okay. Right, so thymic epithelial cell, thyroid epithelial cell, vascular endothelial cells. So all these can be considered as vascular endothelial cells or the cells which will line up the blood vessels, right? So these can also present antigens, right? But they are non-professional. They do not mean for these purposes, but they can perform this work. So therefore they are called a non-professional antigen presenting cells. Okay, <laughs> interestingly, actually, uh, this statement is also written here also. So you can take this from here. Uh, wait a minute, I want to annotate this so that you can understand. See this. So dendritic cells are most, uh, most effective of the antigen presenting cells because uh, they constitutively express high level of class second MSC molecules and post-stimulatory molecules, uh, B7, actually, we have studied uh, in the last discussion. Uh, activity, they can activate the new T cells uh, very effectively or efficiently, right? So, 
so you will find at multiple places in this book therefore, therefore this book is considered as best uh, immunology book because uh, the important things are repeated several times in the text so if you are going through this book you will understand each and everything and multiple time you need, you need not uh, turn the page actually because each chapter is written in such a way cytosolic pathway endocytic pathway there are two pathways which are generally used to present antigen right so cytosolic pathway uh, so first of all we need to understand the type of antigens which can have we may have two type of antigens which is uh, may be present inside the cell or it is coming from outside so it is if it is outside antigen it is called exogenous antigen if it is coming from outside it should be processed properly and then it will be presented along with msc class second molecule right so this pathway of presenting the exogenous antigen which is not the part of our cell but it is coming from outside and should be presented with the help of msc class second molecules is known is the pathway is known as endocytic pathway why endocytic because antigen will uh, be entrapped endosome is formed the antigen is uh, cleaved into smaller peptides and then it will be presented with the help of msc class 1 uh, sorry second molecules class second molecule so this is endocytic pathway second is cytosolic pathway if the antigen is present itself in the cytoplasm in the uh, if it is an endogenous antigen it is present inside the cell with the help of ubiquitin protein it the target antigen or protein will be so do you know ubiquitin mediated uh, degradation proteasomal degradation have you studied about obviously you have studied this term so ubiquitin is a protein which is a kind of tag which will uh, be present over the target proteins which are undergoing cleavage means which are which should be degraded so all those protein first will be having <laughs> this protein called ubiquitin and obviously it will require some atp molecules this is a atp requiring process and uh, proteasomal degradation proteasomal molecules uh, will degrade those particular proteins which are present so some for example some viral proteins right cytoplasmic proteasome complex will be made and this proteasome will uh, cleave the protein into smaller peptides which will the help of this uh, tap is a kind of uh, channel through which these will uh, move right do you have a query no sir okay so peptides then will move through a channel called tap into the endoplasmic membrane and find so endoplasmic reticulum er and then they are presented with the help of msc class one molecule all right and uh, the second is these exogenous antigens will be presented with the help of MSC second class uh, molecule in surface of antigen presenting cells. Mainly. So it is written here. There are some on the given. You need, you can read them. This diagram is showing uh, the protein is tagged with ubiquitin molecule. Ubiquitin is a protein which is uh, having this peptide bond or amide bond. And if this tag is added to a protein target. Finally, what will happen? Actually, this process will require ATP, and it will take two uh, phosphate molecules. So the ATP will be converted into AMP, and pyrophosphate is released. So the two ATP molecules energy will be utilized in this tagging. Finally, the protein will be tagged, and it is recognized as a target protein for degeneration or degradation by proteasomal uh, enzyme. So this proteasome will come, and it will degrade this large protein into smaller, smaller peptide fragments, which are having 10 to 20. Uh, amino acid uh, long so that they can be easily picked up by the MSC class molecules and they can be presented. Majorly, these uh, proteins are endogenous, sorry, present inside the cell and therefore they are showing the cytosolic pathway, endogenous antigen, and they are uh, coming under the cytosolic pathway, right? And should be presented with the help of MSC class 1 molecules. 
there is a diagram actually I'm trying to find. So first of all, this tap one and tap two, they are kind of channels. So they are present over rough endoplasmic uh, reticulum membrane. All right. So these channels are responsible for moving the smaller fragments inside the lumen of endoplasmic reticulum where uh, already there are large number of receptors including call reticulin, tapacin, etc. Right. So, and this is MSC class one molecule. So MSC class one molecule is interacting with uh, this tapacin and cal reticulin. Uh, but, uh, okay, so this is coming from this side. Okay, so this arrow is showing actually this MSC class one molecule is having only one chain, alpha chain. And then uh, one more molecule is interacting with it that is known as polnexin. Then it will mature into an another form which is showing interaction with the tapacin and it is the small fragment. Are you able to see this small fragment? What is the name of the small fragment? Have you heard about beta 2 microglobulin? Actually, I need to give one day to one class to the MSc <coughs> discussion. But uh, since it is given here, so uh, MSc class 1 molecule is actually having uh, one more segment that, that is called as uh, beta 2 microglobulin. Eva, are you listening? If you started, yes, uh, okay. Have you already studied about the structure of MSc class one and second molecules or should I go into the details of these structures? Yes, sir. I haven't studied. You did not study, okay. So leave it for a minute here so that you can understand this better. Uh, we are moving to MSc chapter so that you can understand the structure of MSc molecules. So what are the basic differences between a, between a class one and class second molecule, right? So we are moving to page number. Actually, we are, I have two editions. One is uh, sixth and one is seventh edition. And the page numbers are very different. So sometimes I also face some problem <coughs> finding the exact. Oh no, it should not come. So. This is 191, all right, so. One eighty nine, not too far, actually. All right, so this diagram actually I was searching for this one because this is very <coughs> much informative. Actually, what is the major difference between an MSc class one and a second molecule is the structure of uh, their chain. So it is having an alpha chain, uh, which is uh, bind to this plasma membrane. So actually, obviously, if it is present over the cell membrane, so and, and if it is class one molecule, class one MSc molecule, all the nucleated cells do have this class one MSC molecules over their surface. This we have studied. And second thing we have covered is all the antigen presenting cells, they would present the antigen with the help of MSC class second molecules. So those second diagram is actually showing the MSC class second molecule, uh, which is present over the, so this diagram is showing the structure which is present over antigen presenting cells. All right, now what is the difference? So it is having alpha one and alpha two, alpha three, three domains of the same chain. And if you recognize this, this alpha one and alpha two are having a groove in between where exactly this antigen will bind. 
So the same chain is going to bind with the antigen molecule in the case of class one molecule. Whereas in case of class two, actually there are two chains. One is uh, alpha, which is having two domain, alpha one and alpha two, obviously, and beta is having beta one and beta two. All right, so alpha one and beta one, they are having this group where uh, uh, both the peptides will, uh, will interacting and they are making this group-like structure so that uh, the antigen can bind like this. Understood? So in case of class one, only one chain is there to bind with the antigen, whereas in case of class two, there are two separate chains which are interacting with each other to make this antigen binding site so that peptide will be presented. Now you can understand this by looking at the structure which is going to bind with large antigen molecule, obviously class second molecule because it is having deep group, right? So it can bind with a slightly larger peptide fragment in comparison to the class one molecule. And the structure and the differences are obviously given in the form of a table somewhere. Right, so it is given here, class one and class two molecules. So peptide binding domain, alpha one, alpha two. Same chain is making this peptide binding domain or antigen binding domain uh, during representation, right? Class second, it is made up of alpha one and beta one. Uh, nature closed at both ends, but it is open at both ends. It will bind, it will recognize A to 10 amino acid uh, peptides, but it can recognize 13 to 18 amino acids uh, peptides because uh, the structure is so that it can uh, bind with a large peptide fragment in comparison to class one. Got it? Now the major thing is, actually I wanted to show you uh, this one, beta two microglobulin. So uh, though it is having one major peptide, which is having three domains, so alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. So this is the same peptide alpha but it is having a little fragment of another chain also, which is actually called beta two microglobulin, which is not present in the class two case, in the case of MSC class second molecule. So this beta two microglobulin is a structure, which is a small fragment, which is actually uh, not very efficiently interacting, but there are some non-covalent interactions with the alpha chain. Uh, but the small fragment, this beta two microglobulin is do present in the case of class one molecule. So this small structure is actually given in this diagram also. So this small chain, which is beta two microglobulin is shown in red here, whereas this domain alpha one, alpha two, alpha three are shown here and a peptide binding cleft is shown in the form of this depression, right? All right, so we move back to our discussion so that we can finish it. Right, so we were discussing this. So obviously uh, this is cytosolic or endocytic, uh, cytosolic pathway, which is for endogenous antigens. So it will be presented with MSC class one molecules and MSC class one molecule is having the smaller uh, uh, peptide which is called beta 2 microglobulin. This triangular shape structure is beta 2 microglobulin. Then it is also interacting with call reticulin and tapasin, right? Finally, what will happen? This small fragment will, uh, which is of A to 10 amino acid molecules, will bind with MSC class 1 molecule, this group, and it will be represented over, over the cell surface, which is given in the next diagram. So the class one molecule alpha chain is here. First of all, it is interacting with collaxin. Collaxin associated class one alpha chain, then beta two microglobulin will come and it will uh, lose the collaxin, right? So the tapsin, tapasin and the cal reticulin will also come and it will make this structure. Finally, what will happen? The peptide will come. And uh, this, when this peptide will come, collaxin will be, be will be um, lost. So this collaxin is actually responsible for uh, it will not allow anything to bind with MSC class one molecule antigen binding group. It is protecting this molecule, right? Somehow, 
and the peptide will come, which is a fragment of large protein, and it will bind with the class one molecule. Other proteins are also lost, means the tapacin and calreticulin, uh, which are also uh, inhibiting the binding of uh, other molecules, so that only peptide fragments, which are coming from antigen protein, uh, will bind with the MSC class one molecule, will bind with it, and it will lead to the uh, loss of tapacin and cal calreticulin. Then this MSC class one molecule will be presented. It will exit the endoplasmic reticulum and it will be presented over, over the cell surface. Now this is again showing the same thing. So uh, this is tapacin. This is calreticulin. This is beta two microglobulin. Oh, okay, it is written here. So finally, what will happen? The step, which is a kind of transporter, it will allow the uh, fragments which are coming from out of proteasome into the endoplasmic reticulum uh, lumen and then uh, the, it will bind with the MSC class 1 molecule. MSC class 1 molecule in the form of a structure, it will move to the surface of the cell and will present the antigen over cell surface along with the MSC class 1 molecule. So this complete pathway is actually called as endogenous pathway. It is uh, it endogenous pathway or cytosolic pathway. You can call either way endogenous pathway or it is for the endogenous antigens and it is also called as cytosolic pathway. Second one is exogenous pathway, which is for the antigens which are coming from outside. All right, so what is the difference? Here, there is an invariant chain-like structure which is present over MSC class second molecule, uh, which is, see this, it is blocking the groove where the peptide fragment is going to bind. It will not, it will not be released until and unless there is a peptide fragment. So what will happen? It will come in form of endosome and then in the Golgi body, uh, this, fragment, this invariant fragment will be digested. Invariant chain will be digested. Digested means it will be cleaved. Only a small fragment of this invariant chain will remain and this is known as clip. Clip is meant so that it will not allow any non-relevant antigenic molecule to bind to this groove. Finally, what will happen? Some antigenic fragments will come and this clip will be lost so that uh, the antigenic fragments will bind to the MSC class second molecules, which are exogenous antigenic fragments. So the exogenous antigen is taken up in the endosome and with the help of lysosomes or hydrolytic enzymes, it will be degraded into the smaller fragments. Then it will bind with the MSC class second molecule and will be presented over the uh, antigen presenting cell. So mediate HLM-DM, mediate exchange of clip for the antigenic peptide. A clip is removed and HLA, HLA DM, human leukocyte antigen DM will exchange this peptide fragment and it will remove the clip. Finally, it will be presented over the cell surface. So there are these two major pathways how two different types of antigens can be presented to the cell surface. One is exogenous antigen, one is endogenous antigen. So we have studied two pathways. One is cytosolic pathway, one is endocytic pathway, right? Cytosolic pathway for endogenous antigens and uh, second one is endocytic pathway for the exogenous antigens. So this you need to remember. I hope I'm running out of time. So should I stop because it will take time to cover the spleen uh, if I start now. Is actually today I was having one problem with my system, so my system.